the farm near our house had a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin patch on Halloween. It was pretty cool to look at. A whole field filled with meticulously carved pumpkins with their grotesque faces glowing from the candlelight within. There was candy strewn about it in little baggies. And kids of all ages visited either before or after they trick-or-treated to get some extra loot. We moved in across the street from the field a couple years ago. At first we loved the idea of the jack-o'-lantern pumpkin patch. It looked quite haunting and really spoke to the Halloween spirit in me and my wife. But when Halloween was over, the farmer didn't take the jack-o'-lanterns away, he just left them to rot. I assumed it was, uh, it was to fertilize the ground for whatever crop he had planted in the spring. It made sense he wouldn't want all the organic material to go to waste. But the problem was they'd attract animals, animals and bugs, in the unseasonably warm November we had last year. The smell of the rotting gourds brought critters from far and wide to the field. And when they were done eating, they'd wander the neighborhood. Being a small town, there was little anyone could do to stop the farmer, whose name was Reuben, from doing what he wanted to do on his property. We had to deal with the deer and skunks and coyotes and the foxes and flies and bees and the bats all eating and shitting and fucking their way across the town until no more pumpkins were left. Last year, I decided to approach Reuben while he was setting up the jack-o'-lanterns. He, I mean, he was a friendly guy. There was never any doubting that. I explained the issue and he listened and nodded. He said a few other people had told him the same thing, and he'd fix the fences over the summer so that there wouldn't be a problem anymore. Besides, he told me if a smile last year was just a test run. This Halloween, everything's going to be just perfect. On Halloween, the jack-o'-lantern field looked even better than it had the year before. Even though the arrangement was the same, Ruben had hired some of the artists to collaborate and create truly monstrous designs for the pumpkins. They were awesome. Even I did a walkthrough by myself in the early afternoon before the candles were lit just to take it all in. I felt like a kid again. And as the evening was coming to a close, we'd given out the majority of our candy to the neighborhood children. We were getting ready to turn off the light and lock up. When... When we heard sirens approaching, I looked outside and saw a procession of police cars and fire engines and ambulances heading toward us. I stepped out on the porch and watched as they passed our house and took the sharp left into the driveway of Reuben's farmhouse. I sat on the steps with my wife and watched as the lights were flipped on and the field was partially illuminated. Oh my god, I whispered. In the harsh overhead lights, I saw bodies. Bodies on the ground among the glowing jack-o'-lanterns. Small ones. Small costumed ones. Kids. Oh my god, I repeated louder. Paramedics and rescue officials descended on the field and worked to resuscitate the still bodies. One by one, they gave up. Parents were arriving in droves, and the sound of wailing and hysteria filled the air. My wife and I held one another as little bodies with sheets over them were loaded into the ambulances. The next morning, it was all over the news. Thirty-two children dead in an apparent poisoning. Reuben was arrested and questioned. He refused to speak to the investigators, and he was held without bail. Funerals were held and pumpkins began to rot. It was another unseasonably warm November and on cue insects began to discover the field. Clouds of gray flies drifted in and out, blanketing the field in a gray haze as they left their eggs and the pumpkin softening flesh. In the following days, toxology reports on the autopsy children came back. Whatever had poisoned them was still unknown. They'd exhibit all the outward signs of a poisoning cyanosis, hemorrhage, paralysis, etc. But no toxins were found in their bodies. Tissue samples were held for further testing. But the corpses were released to the families. And two weeks later, the air was still thick with flies and bees. We still hadn't had a frost. 
and things that crawled and flew feasted on the pulpy remains of the jack-o'-lanterns. From the house, I, I could see their deformed, hideous faces, faces which no longer evoked a feeling of holiday fun. They were faces that mocked the dead. The incredibly warm autumn continued, 20 degrees above average according to the weatherman. Flowers were blooming and the cherry trees had blossomed a full five months ahead of time. The pumpkins were still there, but mostly formless having succumbed to rot and ravenous of the vermin. As the hot November slouched into December, the luckiest of us had started to forget about the tragedy that had been fallen this town. But we still got reminders, especially on December 2nd when Reuben broke his silence. My cousin Ron works for the police department as a mechanic. He doesn't have any access to criminals or official information, but he talks to the cops a lot, and the cops like to talk. Ron came over on the 2nd before any news had gotten out about Reuben or what he was saying. It was all clear. It was clear he was uncomfortable. Lila and I sat and listened while Ron relayed what his buddy had learned from the detective. The Reuben I knew was nothing like the man being described by my cousin. He blanketed himself with cuts and scars and indecipherable symbols and words. Every inch of his flesh was carved or mutilated in one way or another. Something he'd done with his fingernails over the course of the time he was in jail. The detectives learned that Reuben was ready to talk when he began to scream the names of each dead child just after midnight on the 2nd. He shouted each first, middle, and last name until his voice was hoarse. Detectives stood on the other side of his cell and transcribed what he said. They didn't understand most of it, but it was better than nothing. The main takeaway was a date and time, December 5th, 11 p.m. No one could figure out what he meant by it, so there was a lot of speculation. All the police could do was park a unit over by the farm overnight just in case he had something planned on just in case he had something planned. On the 5th, I sat with Lila and Ron on the front porch and stared at the black field in front of us. 11 came and nothing happened. We waited for a few minutes and I saw a cop across the street standing next to his car, smoking a cigarette. As we were getting ready to go inside, I saw something flicker in the field. A tiny flame. Look, I told the others and pointed. They saw it too, and then more flickers came into view. Hey! I yelled to the cop, and kept pointing at the field. The cop snuffed out his cigarette and walked around the barn to take a look. He got to the side of the field and then raised his radio to call for backup. As we watched, the flickers intensified as if they were from new candles that finally started properly burning their wicks and and after sputtering and threatening to go out. After only a couple minutes, more police cars arrived. I got up and started to cross the street. I needed to see what was going on. Don't, said Lila, as she grabbed my hand, but I shrugged her off and headed toward the fence. I heard Ron walking behind me. The police arrived and lit the field up with their searchlights. We could see the rotten pumpkins sitting in the field, all of single candles sticking out of them. They were shaking. One by one, candles fell and hit the dry straw. The straw ignited, and police officers called for emergency assistance from the fire department. But there was no chance to get there in time. The fire began to rage. Entombed in flame, the rotting pumpkin started to burst only after their pulpy bodies had disintegrated. Did we see what was inside? Oh my fucking- Ron half whispered, half prayed. In the place of each pumpkin, there was a small human-shaped thing sitting with its head down in its knees and clutched into its chest. The heat intensified further and I backed up, but I still saw it all. One by one, the things rose on the sturdy legs and stood erect. They were growing. And soon they reached the size of the children who died, their skin began to 
char and they walked out of the f and they walked out of the flames towards the crowd of the police officers without any idea what to do but terrified out of their minds some began to shoot the bullets did not stop them round after round tore through the fire spawn children exiting their backs and legs and heads in the in and heads in the kisser of gore but but they, they they walked ever ever forward soon the officers who'd fired fell to the ground and they didn't move for a second but then they started to rot just like the pumpkins other officers backed away i walked all the way back to my house and i watched from the doorway with my wife and cousin we were horrified a procession of children walked down the street followed by the police cars. Firefighters worked to put out the blazing field, and after a little while, they succeeded. Ron turned on his police scanner, and we sat in the living room, listening with horror as the news of dead cops and other officials came in. The children have reached the prison. The children have burned through the cell of Reuben Rendell. The children are carrying Rendell back the way they came. Oh, fuck! I said and opened the front door. They were coming back down the street, a procession of blackened, smoldering kids carrying a burning man, Reuben, and he was screaming. It's almost done. It's almost finished. He screamed with peals of hysteria, or hysterical laughter as he burned. The children carried him into the field and placed him in the center. They then placed themselves in the same spots as the pumpkins from which they emerged. Most of them had gone out, while some still glowed with dull red fire before Reuben burned to death and he unleashed one final scream. Please, accept this offering. Is this enough? Is this what you needed? See me through. See me through. There was no sound from him after the final word. Nothing but crackling of dying flames. And after that, silence. The following days were a whirlwind of investigations, media visits, and speculation. No one knew what happened. No one knew what Reuben had done. And for a while, it was still a mystery on how the kids had been poisoned in the first place. A mystery, that is, until Jasmine McRae, the mother of the child who was fortunate enough to have been too sick to trick-or-treat, and a small letter in her son's toy chest. It read, For a special night of Halloween fun, draw this little picture on a piece of paper and swallow it. Then come to Farmer Reuben's pumpkin patch to trick or treat. You will never, ever want to leave. The picture was of an inverted star, a pentagram. Jasmine's son told her Reuben had given them to the kids at the recess one day and after he talked to the classes about what it was like to be a farmer he came to them individually and made them promise to throw it away after they read it and not tell their parents jasmine gave the letter to the police and then told the media while the superstitious residents of the town took that as the answer to what had happened skeptics like myself couldn't believe it even after of what i had seen I couldn't believe something supernatural had occurred. But then the photographs came in. The aerial photographs from the news helicopter the day after the Holocaust at that field. Clearly marked in the carbon and ash was the shape of a pentagram. The exact shape the pumpkins had been rearranged in. No one had noticed it from the ground and at the center of the pentagram where Reuben had screamed his final pleading prayer. Four words were burnt into the dirt. The answer to the old farmer's prayers. Not enough. Never enough.